Okay, it is five past 10. So we are going to start um, and hopefully those who are joining a bit late will connect with us along the way. Um, so today it is the second seminar of the year within the Drivel Action for Climate Resilience Project. Earlier in the year, we had a seminar on drought with Dr. Roda Malgas. Um, and today we are very lucky to have three really incredible speakers joining us. Um, some of you will know John Zira. He is a permaculture expert um, and has is the pioneer of the company Okuvuna um, and has worked both with SAFSI and with Chef and with um, COPAC and the Southern African um, uh, Food Sovereignty Movement through COPAC. Um, just a request that everybody mute themselves when they join so that we can ensure that, that, that everyone uh, that the seminar goes smoothly. Um, and yeah, so big, big welcome to John Zira. Uh, we also have with us today Dr. Tafadzwa Mapaudi, uh, who is the research group leader for the Sustainable Resilience Food System at the International uh, Water Management Institute and also affiliated with the University of Nottingham. Malaysia and the University of Kwazulu Natal. And last but not least, we have uh, Sibongile Mutungwa, from, who is the director for the Women's Leadership and Training Program, which is an NGO based in KwaZulu Natal. Um, and she is a grassroots activist on, um, very, very involved with grassroots activism relating to social and climate justice with a focus on gender, leadership and climate change and biodiversity. So um, the topic of today's seminar is food sovereignty. Um, and we all know that food is fundamental to living. It connects us to each other. It connects us to our cultures. Um, to our histories, to the land. Uh, and in light of this, um, we will be running a set of poll questions just to get you uh, thinking about some questions around um, where you access your food and, um, and the different approaches that you use and practices in your, in your spaces uh, and your communities around um, indigenous and traditional practices that might uh -huh. be facilitating uh, greater sovereignty over your food systems. Um, but before we get into the details of that, and, I, and I'll just, Claire, if you can launch um, the poll questions um, so that they are uh, accessible to respond uh, to, for people. You'll, you should see the poll um, sort of icon at the bottom of your uh, screen and it should say food seminar poll um, and there should be two questions where do you get your food from and the second question is do you or your community use indigenous or traditional practices or varieties of plants to grow and to preserve food um, so yeah over the course of today's seminar um, it will be good to get your responses uh, on this and we'll end it at the end of the seminar. Um, so the other thing that um, we have today is a opening prayer, uh, a poem that was written for the seminar by one of the speakers. Um, so I'm just going to uh, shift over to that poem and um, and then hand over to Sibongile, 
who will be reading this poem that she wrote, which was, um, yeah, uh, really beautiful. So Sibungile, uh, over to you, and I'll just, uh, hopefully you can still see this screen and then I'll, I'll just um, move down as you are reading. Thank you very much, Tara. Um, good morning, everyone. Sanibona uh, Nick. This is how I look like these days. So if you see that picture, and it's done better with a group of people face to face. So if you, so you'll need to bear with me if there are things that don't make uh, enough sense to you. Okay, so I begin. This day, I watch her walk, walking around the field in silence. The silence gave birth to music. The music gave birth to action. And I found myself in the place of wonder. This day, I watched her walking around the field in silence. She carried the bucket of seeds under her arm. Behind her, a small girl carried a small pot with water. She walked facing the north and she was singing. Go sazane yezulu bamata tiko wenanda kumisa. Oh, just a moment. I see we're having an uh, audio challenge. Okay, maybe I need to uh, yeah. remove yeah. Oh yeah, maybe Kat, there we go, no video, sadly. All right, thank you, please, please continue. So walking north of the field, the music became softer. She cast the seed to spread as far as she can. While singing, Amata Tumisa and Tumisa, the little girl has now got into the chant. Tumisa, 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 Tumisa. As if she has known the song from the womb. She walked east of the field with calm music. She put her basket on, on the girl's head, raised her head, as high as she could. She walked with her hands high up, chanting, Bamata, Tumisa, Tumisa, Bamata, Tumisa, Tumisa. As she walked south, she lowered her hands. She took the pot of water from the little girl behind her. She sprinkled the water as she was walking and chanting, Tumisa, 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 Tamata, Tumisa, Tumisa. As she moved west of the field, she gave back the pot of water to the girl. The girl noticed that at the bottom of the pot, there were were the remains of various plants, weeds and roots. So the water had various things added for the field to kumisa, kumisa, kumisa. When the plants grew from the soil, the girl that, sorry, the girl understood, understood that from harvest came seeds, faith, silence and sang when the when she is, wherever she is today, sorry. When times are tough, she goes back and sing. Go 
Sazana Zulu Pamata Tumisa Tumisa Sazana Zulu Pamata Tumisa Tumisa Pamata Tumisa 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 Thank you so much, Sibungile. Um, just a request, please everyone mute yourself. Uh, or Claire, if you could just keep track of, of people who are who are not muted and, and mute them. Um Otherwise, it's, it's uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, or maybe I'll just double check who's unmuted. I think at the moment, everyone besides Sibongile um, and yourself were muted. Okay, but uh, I, there was some background from Nombini, but. Uh, I think it's gone now. Um, okay. Um, great. So uh, thank you so much, Sibungile. That was a really beautiful um, poem. And thank you for sharing that with us. Um, we really appreciate that. Um, I'm just going to quickly get back to the main presentation. Um, uh, introductory presentation. Um, so I have introduced our speakers, I've introduced the poll questions, and we've had the wonderful poem from Sibongile. Um, and um, so I just want to highlight a few points to set the scene for why we are talking about food sovereignty. So one of the things to bear in mind is that industrial agriculture, which is the agricultural system that is the, the dominant system at the moment, is largely responsible for causing climate change. So 34% of the greenhouse gas emissions um, come from industrial agriculture. Uh, and the greenhouse gas emissions are the gases that, as we have explained previously, contribute to causing climate change. Simultaneously, as many of us in this uh, seminar room will know, the impacts of climate change disrupt and threaten our food systems, whether this is through droughts or heat stress um, or floods. And so we both need to think about how our food systems contribute to causing climate change, but also how our food systems are going to be impacted by the impacts of climate change, by drought, by floods, by heat waves. Um, and how we need to be thinking about how to build better food systems and more resilient food systems to be responsive to these impacts while also not contributing to causing climate change. And in this context, um, there are often two uh, sort of terms that get thrown around um, when we talk about hunger and food access. And these two terms are food sovereignty, which is the focus of today's seminar. And the other one you might have heard of is food security. So I just wanna set the scene before we hear from our speakers about the distinction between these two and in doing so, define um, food sovereignty a bit more clearly for you. So food sovereignty um, is um, a democratic food system. It prioritizes the interests of producers of food, so small scale farmers, it prioritizes the interests of the consumers of food, so all of us in the seminar room. 
It also takes more ecological approaches, as we'll be hearing um, about today, and as a result, contributes less to causing climate change um, and producing the greenhouse gas emissions that cause climate change. And it is, it is centered on um, local grassroots food production of a variety of nutritious food. In contrast, food security is really um, not questioning a cur the current corporate food system. Um, it encourages industrial approaches to agriculture. Um, and uh, it is often in support of international food aid, um, uh, food security gets thrown around in this context, which is often uh, lacking in nutrition. Um, and so I think what I really want you to bear in mind um, in this uh, seminar is to think about the fact that climate change threatens our food systems. And I also want us to, to think about how food sovereignty as a concept highlights questions of power. So who controls and who has access to healthy and nutritious food? And how can food sovereignty be a means to create more equality around this? Um, so I'm going to end there um, and just, yeah, uh, they, I will show this to you at the end of the session, but there are some resources and toolkits available on the Climate Justice Charter Movement website um, that are very, that might be very interesting for some of you to look into, um, but I'll share those at the end of the seminar once we've heard from our speakers. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand over to John, um, who is going to be talking to us about agroecology. Um, so, yeah, John, over to you. Okay, um, uh, good morning and uh, greetings to all. Um, I'm going just to show you my garden in a few seconds, and then I switch off the video so that uh, uh, the internet connection is better. So looking at uh, my garden, I, I'm sitting in my garden right now, and probably you can see uh, that uh, there is a, a wide variety of plants in the garden, and I have over uh, hundreds, 200 more, yeah, different kind of plants. And we have bees, we have chickens, we have geese, and we have uh, uh, different uh, uh, species of uh, uh, animals and uh, different species of crops. And uh, yeah, so why am I showing you this? It's basically uh, because I'm wondering, I'm pondering and say, if I haven't done this, it means I'll be trapped in getting food from somebody from somewhere or from industrial agriculture where I don't even know how the food is grown and where I don't even know uh, the type of chemicals they are using in there, how they are dangerous to me. Then I wake out and say, what was happening 50 years ago in terms of food, in terms of medicine, in terms of forest? And I'll find that in food, food was free in the forest. And people could farm within their homesteads, within the immediate uh, uh, land. And now with the industrial uh, agriculture, we are getting food from shops. And what is gonna happen in the future? The future will have food insecurity or will have fake food and modified food. That is the, the future about food, food. If we cannot take action now. And what is gonna happen with medicine? 
before medicine was from forest, from the plants we, we, you grow or from the, the species in the forest. But what is happening now, it is controlled by industrial pharmaceutical systems. And that's where medicine is coming. And you don't know what's in the tablets. You don't know what's in the medicine. And what is gonna be in the future again, is gonna be fake medicine and modified medicine. And forests, before, like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we used to have, or 100 years ago, we used to have forest, good forest, that could provide us with food, that could provide us with the, everything that we need. And what is happening now? You don't see forest, but you see monoculture, a growing of one type of species in an area. And the future, it will be plastic flowers, plastic trees in our houses, in our farms, and that's what we are gonna eat if we are not careful. And landscape, what is happening on the landscape? Before, it was a diverse of species. And now, uh, and uh, now we, had, we have desertification, we have soil erosion, we have monoculture practices. What is happening in the future? We are going to have more bare soil, dusty, pollution, and diseases, hunger, and death. So if we are not taking care of our landscape today, we are going to have disaster in the next few, few years. So this is an indication of what is happening within a, a climate change crisis. That the climate change is caused by industrial agriculture, as the former speaker mentioned, but also it's caused by the policymakers because the policymakers are not serious in looking at what really do we need as indigenous people of Africa or of South Africa. So also us in our homesteads, we have deserts. You, you receive rain, it just run to the river. You don't catch it. And there is erosion right in your fields. And it is, mean, it is a means that you are contributing negatively to the environment. So we are saying, Climate change is real. And since it's real, but it's exacerbated, it's increased by us. So who has to change? It is us who have to change to suit, to make sure that we have a better life. So we all know that climate change has a negative impact to food system, uh, leading to food shortages, crop failures, soil degradation, and pollution because food is coming from other countries. And what are they using? They're using trucks, they're using yellow plane and they pollute the environment. But if you think of producing food within your vicinity, within your farm, like here, I'm producing over 200 plants and I'm not causing, I'm contributing to the positive uh, environmental systems. But if you are getting food from the shops, the food from shop is coming from farmers or from, uh, from other countries. And the transportation causes environmental uh, pollution. And what we are talking about is uh, South Africa, like many other countries, it's faced by a negative impact of uh, climate change. And some of them have been mentioned earlier, like drought. Drought is causing the shortage of food water uh, and hunger, health, it's, it's, it's impacted on. Extreme weather, we know there's floods. Last month, there was a heat wave in South Africa oh, yeah. where wildlife is uh, dying. We are actually uh, causing, the climate change is causing disaster in our environment. Biodiversity loss. Uh, it's also impacting on water availability and accessibility. And on soil, soil erosion, plants, animals, uh, health, it's also impacted because of the biodiversity loss. The rising sea levels, it's happening and it's causing flood and erosion in our communities. Health impacts uh, in terms of air pollution and the spread of diseases and fever in our community and within our people and even animals. 
And with this crisis, it is important to set an agent action. Who is supposed to be part of it? It's us. So that we protect our people, we protect our environment. And then what can we do to mitigate and adapt the climate crisis? That's protect, that's, we have to protect ourselves and protect the environment. But what steps can we put in place? We need to understand if we have freedom, if we are free, if you are getting food from somewhere, you are not free. You are controlled by the uh, corporates. You are controlled by industrial agriculture because they decide what to grow and they supply it in the shops. So you do not have freedom. So we here we are saying, let's have a freedom system, which is sovereignty, which brings that you grow your own food or you get food from local uh, communities and you know the food is distributed within. It's not taking long distance to get food. And the consumption pattern, it's sustainable and it's within the communities or within the cities where we live. So there are approaches that we need to consider in that. We need to understand the importance of traditional knowledge. Traditional knowledge. What are traditional knowledge? Our grandfathers, our forefathers, how have they been sustaining themselves? So we need to tap into that, take the good things that has been happening and bring it into the farming system. Small scale and diversified farming practice. Africa in general, it's, it's actually fed by the small scale farmers. About 70% of the food is coming from scale, small scale farmers. Why do we need commercial farmers? The commercial farmers are there because they are driven by the industrial agriculture and funding from big companies and also support from the government. And if us, we have a movement as communities, as small scale farmers, we demand that investment or support from the government should come from to small scale farmers, we can make a change. We can also look at sustainable food production and consumption. How do we, in, in current situation, we found that there are many, yeah, this, oh, there are so much food that is coming to cities. Like in Johannesburg, you go to city DP, there's so much food that is coming there. But not all of the food, I can say uh, over 60% uh, of the food is not consumed, is not used, it's going to waste. So in our system, what we are talking about, we need zero waste system, where we grow enough for ourselves and distribute to, to local people and there is no waste that is uh, created. And then we work on building towards a resilient and sustainable food systems. So together we can do that. So to do that on an environmental side, we need to understand what is agroecology is all about. It is a science based on approach to agriculture that seeks to work with nature rather than against it. It reduces or minimizes negative environmental impacts. So I'll share with you some agroecological practices. And I've been working some farmers, some of them I see they're in this discussion, and we've been talking about this, uh, that if we want to have a positive change to the environment, we need to practice this, promote a promotion of soil health. Support soil mi microbes to plant food, e.g. biofertilizers, GMCC, the GMC means, GMCC means green manure cover crop. Uh, it's a system that you can practice to make sure that uh, the, the microbes in the soil, they are fed, they are promoted, they are protected. Vermiculture, that's earthworm farming, bokashi, crop rotation, intercropping and others. These are systems that we can in introduce wherever we are in the agro to promote agroecology. In agroecology, we talk of the di design diversity systems. Diversity system, we are saying, let's keep more a lot. As you saw in my garden, there is not one plant. We have a diverse of species. 
Some are flowering to bring these in. Some are covering the ground. Some are told to give fruits. Some are herbs. And some are uh, regenerating the soil by releasing nutrients into the soil. So by so doing, we can create uh, buffer zones, wind breaks, afforestation, crops and herbs, and uh, integrate with animals. We can create interconnectedness of elements. This is about bringing in buffer zones uh, or creating a system with different zones. Because when you have the, your garden or your farm, you should know where you are going to harvest the herbs. So it's a section that you can create in terms of zoning. A zone one is herbs. Zone two can be your vegetables. Zone three can be your, uh, your crops like maize. And zone four can be your nursery. And zone five can be your forest, indigenous forest and bees. So it's designed appropriately so that you are maximizing uh, the area and also working in, 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 in harmony with nature. Zero waste management system. By producing a waste in the, from the kitchen, you can take it into vermiculture. You can take it, you can take dry organic matter into compost. So in our system, in agroecology, there is no waste. And natural pest management, you can practice natural pest management system by building predators habitats. Like you have an aphid in the garden, it can only be controlled easily by small insects like wasps. You can have uh, small insects like, uh, like snails or like snails in the garden and they can be controlled by chickens. So there is a system that you can create in a garden or in a farm to make sure that the ecosystem works on its own. So together, food sovereignty and agroecology can help address challenges posed by the climate crisis. So let's not be afraid of climate crisis if we can able to design something within our home states. Let's work on it and it can create a positive impact to the world environment and also to the, to the nation, to the country. So build and it can build more resilient and sustainable food system. And as I said, to consider the local systems, local knowledge systems into play. And the no, local knowledge systems, I have some examples to share with you. What are they? The system of agroforestry. Long before industrial agriculture, farmers has been mixing maize or crops or beans with trees. It's an agroforest system. Animals has been a part of the, the system by getting uh, food from the field. And soil were conserved and there were no soil erosion. The uh, biodiversity was supported and food was provided in abundance. Terracing and condor region as part of the traditional systems. Many farmers long ago, they used to make sure that water doesn't run away from the farm and soil is protected. And, but nowadays you see people, they just cultivate and see water running away from their farm. And when you leave the water running from your farm, you are exporting water to overseas and you will never bring it back again. Make sure that water, a drop of rain that comes in your farm, infiltrating the soil and support the system where you are. Water must not run away or you must not see surface run off water from your farm, from your garden, from your homestead. Seed saving and sharing. How many of us are keeping their indigenous seeds? Seeds is a one way of uh, that the industrial agriculture is doing as a means of colonization. Once you are controlled in seed, you are finished. You, you, you depend from them every year. You get the seed from the industrial agriculture and they supply the type of seed they want. And this seed, you cannot keep your own seed as you go on. But if you keep your indigenous seeds, uh, it means you can save them. You can keep the seeds as you grow, as you grow the crop every year. And these are called 
helium seeds or uh, open pollinated seeds. So we can keep them. Uh, crop diversity is one of the angles uh, that indigenous people have been practicing. That uh, they never grew uh, crops in uh, one type of crop in one field. Always crops were mixed with other species to help in soil uh, nutrients balance and also to help in uh, pest control and uh, uh, other uh, agricultural management. And wild foods and medicine plants. Always our traditional system has been making sure that they leave buffer zone for indigenous medicinal plants and also making sure that they include insects. Insects like uh, uh, mopan worms, like uh, ants, like uh, um, uh, small insects, even like bees to come into a system where they know they help in the integration of the system plus they provide better nutrition to their system, food nutrition system. And the last in that uh, for traditional system, they make sure that all commercial insects are, are kept in the, in the farm and uh, also they are integrated with the wild foods. Uh, the wild foods like uh, eating the Morocco from uh, the forest and that has been practiced. And for us, why are we not practicing it? And once we start practicing this, we are able to change the face of the climate change we are in. So by incorporating indigenous uh, and traditional approaches to food system, we can build sustainable resilience sustainable resilience and equitable food system that are better adapted to the changes of the climate change. We can also reduce meet and mitigate uh, negative environmental impacts associated with industrial agriculture, such as soil erosion, water depletion, and the use of chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and hence these, they can create diseases and sickness to people. So some of us, we are already engaged into food sovereignty and agroecological movement. The movement have the potential to transform food system in, in ways that so, uh, sovereign and resilient can be established. And the movement will provide a lot of uh, learning and sharing. The movement will provide The movement will provide access to information. The movement will provide to make sure that most of us, we are connected and the movement who can help us to, to share and educate the knowledge to younger people. And with the movement, we can make a good voice uh, and lob the government to understand, to listen to what we need to see in our own environment. And with this, I would like to say, thank you. Thank you so much, John, um, for your valuable contribution. You have so much knowledge on this. And I think we could, we could have had a whole seminar just with you talking. Um, uh, and I'm hoping that there will be some time um, after all the presentations are finished. So ask questions um, from the audience. So um, with that, I want to pass over to our next speaker, who is Dr. Tafadwa Mabaudi, um, who's also um, very knowledgeable um, and yeah, definitely looking forward to presentation. So um, Tafadzwa, um, if you want to take over from here, I pass on to you. Okay, uh, thanks very much Tara and uh, good morning everyone. I'm looking forward to the conversations this morning. Let me just try to share my presentation. Okay. 
can you confirm if you can see my presentation, Tara? Yes, we can see it. Thanks. Oh, perfect. Okay, so I've been asked to just shed a bit of light on, on the science behind uh, the importance of neglected and underutilized crops, uh, which we usually abbreviate as NUS or NUS. So just by, by definition, there is, there's not really much of a consensus definition around what these crops are. And they are referred to in with many different words. Uh, some call them under-researched, some call them often crops, some call them just underutilized, some will call them uh, indigenous or traditional crops. But uh, what they have in common is that they, they are broadly part of a larger a portfolio of agrobiodiversity. And they were historically well utilized and used to form a major part of our food systems. But over time, they've been relegated to their current status where they are now regarded more uh, as minor crops. And the, the term underutilized uh, will vary from who, where, and what. Because in some areas, some crops are still by and large very well utilized, while in some areas, the levels of utilization have uh, dropped in previous years. So it, it varies, and you know, it's, so it, is, it is a contextual uh, definition. And they have been mostly promoted uh, on the strength of their diversity and ability to contribute you know, to concepts such as food sovereignty, agroecological principles, and the aspect that they are very much embedded within strong gender and social dynamics. So they present a more inclusive, more equitable, and more resilient uh, form of agriculture. And just building on that for, for better understanding, when I was saying that they were once you know, major crops, but they've since been relegated to their current status of minor crops. So historically, we know that you know, there are about almost 500,000 plant species uh, that have been documented, 30,000 edible plant species. Of those, 7,000 have been cultivated by men. Uh, but over time, only 20 of these have evolved or emerged to be the main food sources, of which only three, wheat, maize, and rice, now account for more than 75% of our calorific intake. So you can see that over time, we've, we've moved from a place of abundance to a, you know, the current status quo where there is very few uh, diversity and rely on a few major crops. And there are various reasons for, for this context, uh, the Green Revolution, which came in, promoted a few major crops, uh, industrialization of agriculture, uh, promoted monocropping and so forth. So there are various reasons which have you know, led us to this point. But essentially what has happened is with that narrowing of diversity, you know, we've lost a lot of the resilience that was inbuilt into our agri-food systems. And consequently, we have increased in terms of our vulnerability because now as we rely on few crops, if they fail, then hunger and famine are quite close by as opposed to when we had, you know, greater diversity. So what does the science tell us about underutilized crops and, you know, their potential? So we know as what John was uh, speaking to now, uh, you know, the, the use of, uh, you know, heirloom seeds passed on from generation to generation. So by that, we mean the product of generations of lenders agriculture. Uh, we call the farmers farmer breeders because the farmers over generations have been deliberately selecting and passing on the seeds with the best attributes and most suited to their environment. So they are locally adapted. Uh, they have tolerance to abiotic stresses such as drought and distolerance. And because of where traditionally 
African people on the continent find themselves in due to the history of colonization and forced movement of people. We find that you know, they're mostly located in harsh marginal agroecologies. And the fact that these crops have been domesticated in these areas uh, means that they're adapted to you know, these harsh agroecologies. So they are suitable to these niche marginal and low input environments. And also they require less to no landscape modification. By that, I mean that they do not impose a significant land use changes as opposed to other forms of agriculture. So they exert less pressure on the ecologies within which they are produced and are hence more environmentally sustainable and more uh, you know, resilient to agriculture. To climate change. In terms of uh, climate resilient agriculture, we know that based on the properties that I have uh, mentioned just now, that uh, these underutilized crops uh, and their suitability under harsh environmental conditions, which we know based on our climate projections that are going to typify uh, the future in terms of our landscapes, that they are suited under climate change. And hence, they are also often sometimes referred to as future crops, mostly because of that uh, quality of theirs. At the same time, uh, just some examples to, to give, uh, to quantify what I was saying. So an example is uh, sorghum. Uh, sorghum is exceptionally uh, drought and heat stress tolerant. It uses very low levels of water compared to maize. Uh, it, it suits very well in you know, these mixed and diverse cropping systems. Uh, and you know, it, it tolerates both extremes, drought and flood, and it has exceptionally good nutritional value. So it comes you know, packed in terms of nutrition. So we call that being nutrient dense. Another example is my, my favorite, uh, Bambara groundnut. Again, highly drought and heat stress tolerant. While it is low yields, uh, they are quite stable over time. Uh, it is a dual purpose crop adapted to soils with low fertility and very well in you know, mixed cropping and agroecological kind of uh, interactions. Uh, another example is, is taro. Uh, again, very you know, nutrient dense and can fit into mixed cropping systems. We've intercropped it with Bambara and we you know, produce very good results with intercropping with Bambara. It is a rich source of vitamins A and C and it also has various other uses. And nowadays, as we see an increased frequency of you know, flash floods and so forth, it is quite a crop to consider in those areas that are going to be prone to flooding. Uh, what we've also done is to look at the suitability of these crops, uh, mapping the land suitability across South Africa to see whether they fit. So by and large, you can see the green, uh, you know, represents the areas that are suitable for, for production. And so by and large, you can see that uh, most of these crops are suitable in the traditional homeland areas. So they could fit into those marginal areas and you know, be part of crop diversification in those systems. And also looking at the suitability uh, under climate change, this is work that we did uh, for KwaZulu-Natal in particular. And by and large, we, we see that there is an expansion in terms of suitable areas under climate change for most of the crops. Uh, with uh, just the exception of taro, but for uh, sorghum, cowpea, and amaranth, there's quite uh, an expansion in terms of suitable areas under climate change. So we do know that they will perform well under climate change. In terms of the distribution of their suitability, again, we, we know that, for example, amaranth is, is highly suitable across a range of environments. The same applies for sorghum uh, and cowpea. Uh, taro has some uh, variability, but in general, uh, these crops are, you know, are suitable candidates for intensification practices 
By this, I mean sustainable intensification, which is more aligned with intercropping, crop rotation, and things like that. We also consider what we call the water food nutrition, drought nexus, which is where we consider the linkage between water from a water use perspective, uh, agriculture from a production perspective, how are they produced, uh, nutrition from the nutritional value and density, and of course, the contribution to human and environmental health. So we know that most of them are drought tolerant and have low uh, water use. We know that uh, they are reliable and a sustainable source of nutrient dense uh, food. We know that they can contribute to dietary diversification, hence uh, improved nutrition and health. And we have quantified this through uh, indices such as nutritional water productivity, which links these different variables. So the science is there confirming uh, you know, their water, nutrition, and health attributes and that they can contribute, especially in marginal areas, which typify the rural landscape in South Africa. Uh, for interest sake, we, we also considered now to say, let's link these crops to diets. How would you know, we link them to diets as substitutes? So this picture is showing where the farmers day some few years back, where we had uh, some farmers from Tuba Tuba, uh, BioWatch farmers, come and visit some of our farmers in Swaimani, just to exchange knowledge around how to cook these crops, you know, exchange recipes. So they had a very good day, uh, the two groups of farmers sharing knowledge and recipes and they cook different dishes. Uh, so you could see that the knowledge is still there. There's a need to document it. And looking at the range of the crops that we have analyzed and worked with, you can see from this diagram, just looking at a comparison of uh, infants, adult males, children, and adult females, and looking at the percentage contribution uh, in, you know, per 100 gram fresh, uh, you can look that by and large, the underutilized crops, which are on your left side and shaded darker, pack more nutrition than the major crops, which are on your left side. So on average, you expect that a lot of these underutilized crops are definitely more nutritious and more nutrient dense uh, than what we currently consume as you know, the major crops. And importantly, they represent a more ecologically friendly type of agriculture. And just building on that, they, you know, the ecologically friendly type of agriculture to, to hit it home, uh, because of their natural nutrient density, uh, their positive attributes in terms of you know, contributing to cell health, and their low carbon footprint, they have an overall a small environmental footprint, which makes them ideal candidates for climate you know, change adaptation. And just you know, zooming into that, uh, and looking at environment, health, and agriculture, and how they can contribute to this context that we are currently dealing with. We look at climate health core benefits associated with underutilized crops. We look at climate environment core benefits associated with these crops, as well as the climate socioeconomic benefits uh, associated with these crops. The socioeconomic core benefits are very important because there are significant opportunities you know, to develop new value chains with lower or no barriers to entry, which would provide significant opportunities for women and youth to be able to come in and participate and earn an income. So that's an important takeaway. We look at it from the broader food system uh, perspective, how they can contribute towards the transition towards more sustainable and healthy food systems uh, through you know, balancing crop diversification, uh, environment, farmer involvement, the, you know, the social inclusion and the social justice issues that Tara was mentioning uh, earlier on and balancing those with consumer requirements for people and planet. So you can see the opportunities for creating an alternative and diverse food system 
that empowers local smallholder farmers whilst catering you know, to their nutrition and health needs and also addressing climate and environmental uh, impacts. So they really pack a very diverse and sustainable punch. Lastly, we did this analysis just to test the question around their broader benefits to the environment, not just from a food perspective, uh, which is you know, uh, the provisioning aspect. So we did a, a systematic review and meta-analysis to really quantify the range of ecosystem services that can be derived from underutilized crops uh, across provisioning, regulating habitat and support and cultural. And you can see that it's quite a, a huge range of services. So beyond just food and nutrition, which is what we are talking about here, there's a whole other dimension of benefits that can be derived from these crops, which is what makes them really important in terms of you know, the future of food and the future of farming. And even linking those to the SDGs, you can see because of that diversity from the range of ecosystem services, they're not just contributing to SDG2, but they're contributing to multiple other SDGs. So they really pack a punch in terms of what they can deliver. So just to conclude, uh, we know for certain uh, through the science that we've done that underutilized crops have tolerance to you know, several abiotic stresses and are adapted to a wide range of agroecological niches and low input agriculture. They offer sustainable solutions for climate change adaptation anchored on you know, biodiversity, social and economic inclusion and conservation. But we still need to do a lot of work in terms of the policy and practice, the science policy practice interface so that we achieve the desired transformation from a policy perspective, which would lead to the mainstreaming of underutilized crops into the broader food system. So thank you very much, uh, Tara. Uh, just to acknowledge the partners in this research, uh, the researchers, the students, uh, farmers, and the funding agencies and colleagues around the globe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tafazwa. This was a really um, great presentation and I think um, complemented uh, our uh, previous speaker, John's presentation uh, greatly. And um, similarly, I, I look forward to the, the question and answer session after our next speaker um, shares her presentation. And I'm sure there'll be lots of questions and desire to, to pick your brain um, on, on your presentation. Um, but without further ado, I will hand over to Sibongile um, to give her presentation with a focus on gender and food sovereignty um, and gender perspectives within agroecology. So, Sibungile, uh, if you want to take it from there. Thank you very much, Tara. Um, I would like to uh, thank the previous speakers because I think they've uh, done a very good job of um, uh, helping us to understand the very bigger issues related to food, but also the very practical ones. So thank you very much. So I'm going to give a, a, a brief experience of uh, the work that we do in women's leadership and training program. We are in KwaZulu Natal, as it has been mentioned. We work with girls and young women. So that is our area of focus. And then we work with communities, especially on agroecology work. And as it has been mentioned uh, by the previous speakers uh, that agroecology has got uh, many, many benefits. And those benefits, it's not just one, it's, just, it's not just food, but it's beyond food. How we see it in our work, uh, we frame it in, you know, in different from different approaches, but I think what I like the one that I like most these days is the one of the decoloniality approach, 
which has got certain pillars that help us to deepen our work and understanding that it is linked not just to us only, but to other people, but also to other issues uh, globally. And one of the, of the things that we have done uh, with the girls and young women is, is to remember what we, you know, the food uh, diversity to go back into the memory of our elders. The food that we, we don't see anymore and also the food that we can still see or the food that we don't um, we don't even know that it's edible, you know, it's food that we can eat. So, uh, in homes by girls and young women themselves talking food has been uh, mainly around, well, one of it is it's sorghum, as it has been mentioned. And the very interesting thing about sorghum is that most uh, of the young people that we started working with, you know, more than so part of the process is to teach ourselves uh, that sorghum is food. It's not just for making umgombo tea. It's food for every day. And uh, so that has been one area. Sibungile, I, I'm just, I just want to stop you there because I think the but, sound, your sound is, um, is not oh. coming in uh, and I, I don't want to miss your contribution. Um, so I'm just wondering whether perhaps uh, we could, Claire could could um, call you on WhatsApp and maybe the, the audio would be better and then Claire could play her audio or um, I'm not sure if the issue okay, is- that would be fine. Uh, okay, so then 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 if you, Claire, if you can call on WhatsApp and then put on loudspeaker. No. Okay, give me a moment, please. Hello. Hi, can you hear? Uh, we Claire will just quickly call you on on WhatsApp and Hello? then. Sibungile. Uh, Hello, Claire. Okay, let's see. So I've now muted Sibungile on um, the call, and um, she's coming through WhatsApp. How's that audio? Tara, can you hear her? I can't hear her on your um okay on your hello can you hear me I see you've muted yourself I think you need to unmute yourself on the WhatsApp call uh, okay is it okay now how's that Tara yeah we can hear now okay please continue Okay, sorry about that. We've got no electricity at this time, and I think things are not just working quite well. Okay, so what we have done with the girls is to say the agroecology work, what it needs, it's also space. So we need land and we need healthy soil. Where we come from, we come from uh, highly eroded uh, uh, communities. And sadly, part of this erosion happened in my lifetime. So I saw when the land was okay, and I saw it being er the soil being eroded. So one of the issues that we had to deal with is to bring uh, the, the healthy soil in our in our gardens and in our fields, because without that, you cannot have and uh, you cannot practice agroecology on poor soil. You need to improve your soil, as it has been mentioned. And to take back the girls to understand in pictures, but also in stories on what used to be produced in, on that land was also an exercise that made uh, the young people to understand that it is important to conserve the soil because once it's, once it's eroded, it is very difficult to repair 
they eroded then. So it's one of the exercises that we have undertaken. And in relation to that, we have also uh, felt that it is important to plant not just for food only, but also to plant for the wildlife and to be conscious of that when you are planting, that you need a variety of, of, of animal, um, bird species, insects and everything to be in your space for your produce to you know to be good you know for, for your food to germinate and for the good produce so the introduction of the planting of trees in in the community but also in the gardens uh, the planting planting smaller trees in the gardens has shown that we can all be able to bring biodiversity not far away, you know, like in the grasslands only or in the forest, but also in our homes, we can bring biodiversity there. And what we believe it is important is that as much as uh, women, older women are highly researched and they are the ones involved in producing food in our communities. What we are arguing on uh, about is that um, if uh, young people are not in the fields producing food, and if they are not in the value adding of that of the produce, then it means the future of our food security is not secure. So that is why we believe that working with girls and young women and unfortunately it's because they are the ones expected to bring food you know at the end of the day in the rural patriarchal homes but as we continue we have also worked with the traditional leaders and boys and young men to say the burden of food doesn't lie with uh, girls and women only they need to participate, but also to take some of the burden uh, on, on girls and young women. And one of the huge burdens on girls and young women in the rural areas is water. So we are encouraging uh, boys, especially, and young men to take uh, part in, in, um, in, bringing, in, in making sure that they secure water uh, nearby for the girls so that they don't end up uh, ex being exposed to dangers of and any other threats that exist in the communities for girls. And with that, the traditional leaders have included the girls and young women, traditional structures, especially when it comes to water. So now, uh, these days, girls are able to sit in the traditional leadership structures and educate because we have found that the most important thing to do is to educate because even the traditional leaders themselves, they did agree that they didn't know and understand how heavy the burden of, of water is on girls and young women. So while we produce food, we also encourage um, a young men to, to, to participate in making sure that there's, there's water for household use, including um, agroecology. And the last part of, of, of the work is to understand that, as uh, uh, the previous speakers as well have mentioned, that the seeds is the most uh, political uh, asset that we have a very important asset that we have, and it has been politicized a lot, that if you do not have, I like what uh, uh, Ms. Benzia said, that if you don't have uh, your, your indigenous seeds, you are finished. I think that's a very uh, uh, important statement because we believe that if you don't have your seeds, if you are hungry, it means you are vulnerable and you can be manipulated because your stomach is hungry, your is hung, is hungry, and your household is also uh, hungry. So, as as households, we encourage that you keep your indigenous seeds. You keep any seed that you have, and because that's the only thing that is yours. Otherwise, you need to buy food. And these days, who has got money to buy food when food is so expensive? 
So it's just not sustainable to buy food. And we believe that in doing so, as Mr. Zira said, that it confirms that many, many small scale farmers are the ones that feed families. How do we know that? During the, the 2020 COVID period, we didn't have the problem of food. We survived and we survived very well at that time because of the food that we had. And also we had the, the uprising, uh, the July uprising in 2021. So everything stopped. But one thing that we had, we had food and that food sustained us as communities. We didn't have to, to, to go hungry. And therefore, we believe that the women in the communities, the households in communities, have the power to keep their own seed, to keep their own food, to sustain households, and also to sustain their communities with good food, food that comes from way back, food that has sustained our, our foremothers and forefathers, but food that we can pass on to the younger generation so that they will understand that it is their heritage. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, Sibongile. So uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand back to Tara. And um, I think you are still in the Zoom room. So I'll end this call and we'll see if, if we can take questions with you um, through the Zoom platform. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Sibongile. That was a really great contribution. And I'm glad that we could still um, hear, hear you through, um, through Claire's uh, Zoom account. Um, so I think what I will do now is open up the floor to questions. Um, it would be... Yeah, feel free to to raise your hand. Um, but if you if you can't find the raise hand function, you can also um, just unmute yourself and um, and then indicate that you would like to ask a question to one of our speakers. So I'm going to um, open up the floor, and while giving you some time to think about potential questions that you might have. Uh, yeah, and questions can also be posted in the chat. Uh, but while we're, we're waiting for the different talks to digest in your brain and um, formulate those questions, I'm going to stop the, the poll and um, also then we can have a little look at the, the um, results. So I'm ending the poll and I am sharing... Oh, wait, hold on. Um, Claire, can you, yeah. <laughs> can you see it? Um, I can, yes. Okay, so you can, you can see the results? Yes, I, I hope the participants can as well. Oh yeah, it might just be hosts. Um, is anyone who is not a host, so... Um, <laughs> I think, I think they should be able to see it. Maybe you can read out the results because in the recording, um, it won't be shared. Okay. So the first question was, where do you get your food from? And the, there were, it was a multiple choice question. So the one option was from the nearest big supermarket. The next option was directly from local farmers. Um, and then from small local shops and then grow food at home. And then the final option was from shared food grown together in your community. And we can see that actually the majority of us, uh, of our food, 61% um, comes from the nearest big supermarket. Um, and 18% comes directly from local farmers. 26% get some of our food from small local shops and 45% um, grow food at home. And then 16% grow food together in, in, in their community. Um, 
so yeah, just something to bear in mind that in in this group we we many of us are very reliant on big supermarkets, which one way or another are still um, feeding into this um, yeah larger food system that is potentially not very um, in line with food sovereignty. So something to to think about. And then um, and then in the second question, which is, do you or your community use indigenous or traditional practices or varieties of plants to grow food and to preserve foods? Drying food, preserving food, fermenting, um, and, and also in terms of indigenous and traditional practices, um, linking back to what the speakers have talked about in terms of you know, growing indigenous varieties of plants and, and seed, saving seeds, in heirloom seeds. So, um, we have interestingly a, a 50 50 percent um, uh, ratio between people who do use tr indigenous and traditional practices or grow traditional and indigenous varieties of food and 50 percent do not so i think yeah interesting interesting responses from everyone interesting to think about um, think about how we can be working towards Building greater sovereignty, food sovereignty within our um, home spaces, um, and also, yeah, encouraging indigenous and traditional uh, food growing and preservation practices. Um, so I hope that now you've had a bit more time to think about questions that you might have. Um, so I'm going to stop talking and. Um, hope that um, some people will pop in and not be too intimidated by the large group um, and yeah pose their questions to our speakers. Yeah, and any comments that you might have might are also welcome. Um, what you thought about the presentations and contributions. We have some people in the room who have received training from John at their vegetable gardens. Maybe they'd also like to comment on how, how it's been going after the training. Okay. Hi, Song. Yes, I'm not sure. Yes, I do have a question to um, Spoon Yes, um, I'm not sure whether um, it was a maybe poor connection on my side, so maybe I didn't hear. Yes. But my question is about uh, I wanted to ask about uh, do they have a specific uh, goal to achieve? Because I, I the, the only time I heard is where. Which it's when she mentioned something to do with um, they are working with only young girls. I'm not sure whether you mentioned something to do with uh, young boys in their organization. So I wanted to maybe exactly talk about that. Maybe they have a specific goal to achieve for them to work with uh, only girls. Thank you. Thanks, Awonga. Um, uh, maybe I'll take, I see. Uh, Dordrecht, I'm not sure if, if it's Nukumla or, um, yeah, I think uh, maybe do you want to uh, put your question forward and then we can um, have responses from the speakers after maybe two questions. Okay, hi, I'm Zamle Salim from Dordrecht. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a fantastic uh, meeting today. Uh, first, that I will comment to Babu Chalim B. Uh, since what we start to work with her in 2019, uh, from that journey, he opened our knowledge uh, so much because uh, we are lived to in the rural area. There, yeah, 
uh, food, you are thought that the food we get only supermarket. Uh, but since what that uh, Mr. John and uh, Mami Chalimbi, they give us uh, more basic that garden is very important that you use the soil. Uh, then thank you so much. And then with a question uh, that I will have to ask with a watering, uh, we tried to stop the water, but, but they didn't come up to stop the water. Uh, then now, uh, since what John was there last year, yes, after the training, uh, he gave us the, the hub, all those seeds. Uh, also, they are growing very well. And then we tasted, and then we we are much more better now because we didn't go to uh, to the farmers to buy the tablets, all those kind of things. Uh, so since what we work with them, I would love to give them fully complement they open our knowledge. We know what is happening to the soil. So we are responsibility as Matubeni, uh, Bonsa Matubeni Prime Cooperative. We are working so hard and then just to make sure that you are not going to buy food from to the shop. We need to uh, take the food from the garden. So I will have to say thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, for that. Um, so maybe if there isn't another question from the audience, we can, uh, I can hand over Sibungile to respond and then after Sibungile, then uh, John. So I think the question from Sabonga was, uh, Sibungile, uh, was uh, towards you, Sibungile, around um, the uh, inclusion of young, young boys as well and what their role is um, in your work. Sarah. And I'm sorry about the poor connection. I hope it will be better now since the electricity is back. Um, so what we do, why we work with girls, it's because where we come from or where we work, girls are not uh, equal as equal to boys and, and young men. Their power is less of the, of the other groups. So it is mainly about uh, girls and women empowerment and why girls, especially from the ages of nine years, is because we believe that if you want to plant a seed, you know, it's better to plant it when they are young and it grows and maybe in the future they will remember to use it. So it's basically based on the inequality in, in, in households, in communities when it comes to 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 girls and boys and young men and young and young girls and young women and also as I did mention maybe I think maybe you didn't hear me at that time that the burden of of food and water sits with girls in the rural communities because it is their gender role to do such uh, tasks and because of that we feel that they they need to have some knowledge to do that However, we do not want to add um, uh, more uh, burden on them. Hence, we have started to work with boys and young men. So we do this work separately because we, in the past, we saw that when boys are with girls, before the girls are empowered, before the young women are empowered, the girls and boys, they take over and then the girls uh, never uh, show their full potential and they just let things to, to be done by boys and young men. So it is for that reason that we run this uh, session separately. And when we are, uh, when we are sure that the, the girls are well equipped with knowledge uh, to be, to act and to be in a conversation as equals, with uh, boys and young men, it is then that they can uh, be together to discuss issues, especially issues of water, issues of um, of uh, of uh, ecosystems uh, development in their own areas, issues of uh, bringing the healthy soils in their in their fields, gardens, their homes, their homestead fields, gardens, and and in their communities. So. Um, 
uh, the last part of that is that the girls have been able to sit within the, the traditional leadership structures in, their, in our communities for the first time to see girls uh, as young as 13 and 14 sitting in those structures and being able to speak and educate the, the traditional leaders about the bedding of, girl, of water on girls and young women. And so in, 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 in Bizo meetings, they've got a slot to, to educate, but also during uh, presentations, the girls, uh, they sit with the traditional leaders without uh, having to fear or thinking that they are less of uh, something in the community. Um, yeah, so it, 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 it is, um, uh, about equipping girls with skills, but also bringing the boys to take some bed in, uh, of uh, that is on uh, girls and, and, and young women. And water is one area that we understand that boys um, can do better and they are beginning to do better. So as in agroecology, but we just need to be aware of the inequalities and, uh, and, and uh, navigate within that with care and with uh, without losing uh, the objective of being a women's uh, organization. Thank you. Thanks, Sibungile. Um, I think that answers Sawonga's question. Um, Sawonga, if you still have any comments, um, yeah, feel free to uh, to say. Um, but I'll just quickly give John a moment to respond um, to the question, all the comments and feedback um, from Zamile, um, from the Dordrecht, or from Boniso Machubene. Uh, but um, yeah, John, if you want to, to come in and, and say anything. Um, Tara, perhaps I can share the voice note from Dombani so while John tries to reconnect. Ah, uh, yeah, we lost him. Okay. Okay, he's yeah, rejoining. Yeah. But let me um, play the message. Dombani so wasn't able to to um, unmute herself. Let's see. No, but uh, it was just a comment for me in my side that the the three presentations were so useful for us. Also, it, it, it will help us to start something at our own, starting from our homes. Otherwise, it was so formative, and we, we learn a lot from it. We will pick up some of the things from the three presentations. Otherwise, we're so thankful about the knowledge that we received today. Thank you, pass for me this message because I can't write even from my chat. Thank you. Okay, I see John. Yeah. Um, thanks, Claire, for sharing that. Um, John, uh, I, I, we lost you for a moment, but we were just um, hoping to uh, get your, um, if you had a, any feedback, um, I'm not sure if you, you heard the contribution from Zamile, um, but yeah, they were, they were talking about um, practices around trying to prevent the loss of water when it was coming down and running off the land. Um, and um, yeah, I'm not sure if you heard the contribution, but if you want to, just respond if you did, and if not, then we can ask Samile to, to repeat himself so that you can hear. Yes, I had the, the contribution, and the, I'm sorry, there was the uh, network problem, but now I'm connected. So uh, about water management, it is um, a very important uh, topic that one has to understand mm -hmm. that water, you have to manage it from the doorstep throughout the fields. And there are some techniques that uh, we promote people to do. So it's all about uh, observing the runoff water within your farm and make sure that uh, you say to yourself, no runoff. So what can I do? Uh, I, you have to take, put some techniques to stop it running away or you have it into the tank or you send it to the, 
uh, uh, underground water tank or into swells or um, the the group in, in for example the group in, from uh, Sports and Jones they've done uh, very good swells very good water harvesting techniques in their project so yeah some farmers can learn from them as well thank you um i see that uh Tafadzwa has had to leave us um uh so unfortunately um, we won't be able to ask any more questions to him but we still have uh Sibongile and john on the call um uh, i see we have a question for you john from Sizeka um around saving seeds after having planted millies um, so the question is, if I have planted millies um, and keep the seed to plant again. Um, oh, yes. Uh, okay, so so she's saying, is, is it possible to plant in the same area or space where it was planted before? Or are, uh, are, the ch are there any chances to get the same production? Yeah, no, you, it's important to do crop rotation. So when you crop maize this season in this area, try to change it to plant somewhere, or you you in rows. If you put the the maize in rows, like in the early cropping system, you have three lines maize, three lines cowpeas, three lines uh, maize. So the next season you bring maize where the cowpeas was. So then it's it's better for the maize to grow well. If you continue using maize in the same area, it depletes certain nutrients. So it will be also hard to bring the nutrients back. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, John. Um, uh, Sawonga, I see your comment about whether we can have someone from Port St. John's to share the strategy that they use to save water. Unfortunately, I think Today, their um, connection is not very good. Not sure if we have any, anyone able to, to talk today from Port St. John's. Um, I think they've been hit quite badly uh, with all the flooding, um, but that is something that we can maybe think about um, for future lessons sharing. Um, um, give it a minute just to see um, if Nobonisa is able to unmute. To say, yeah. Uh, Nobonisa, would you be able to unmute? Yes. Okay. Uh, so there was a question around whether whether you would be able to sh maybe share a little bit about the strategy that is. Um, used in Port St. John's around saving water. Okay. okay. Do you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay, okay. Firstly, uh, I, I, I just want to comment in there as uh, Abigail uh, helped me uh, about uh, this presentation, really. I want to thank, um, Thank John uh, because he visited us, I think, two times or once. I'm, I'm, I'm not remember. But out of these floods, we were affected with, with the, 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 the heavy rain that was happening in Port St. John's. Those guard, the, the, the garden that were the, 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 the communities present pre, uh, doing practicals on it, our crops is there. It was not swiped up. So those can't we made there it makes us um save our 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 crops because uh, before when we have a, a heavy rain you will find that everything that you put on the soil is swiped out you know but out of the 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 the, 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 the training and the, the the practical that they were doing on the on, on the ground it, it saves at as a lot in those two gardens. Otherwise, uh, for us, uh, I think our produce now, in, in fact, harvest will improve because last one, it, it was affected by the, 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 the heavy rain 
and some of the crops were, 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 were rotten and swiped away by, by mud. Ne? So now at least at least we are moving from somewhere to, 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 to somewhere. Thank you. Thanks, Nunguni. So um, I think we have another question uh, for, for John, I think, um, from Suzeka around um, it, the how long one can keep fruit and veggies that have been dried to use. Um, uh, because I guess the, the question is around when one knows when the food is um, no longer safe for consumption because uh, if you buy it from the supermarkets, they have expiry dates. I hope I um, understood that correctly. Um, but John, you can also read the, the question is in the, in the chat. Oh, wait, I think we might have lost John again. Yeah, okay. Um, are there any questions that we have for uh, Sibungile? Or any more questions from the, the audience? Yes, Tana. Um, my question is uh, based, is directed to Sibungile. Um, I want to know about the, the strategy she used to to make those girls to be interested more, and also the strategy she also used to, to yes, she used to, to Nancy. The strategy she used to, to, to make those boys really part of the, of the organization as well. Thank you so much. Thanks, Saonga uh, Sibungile. For the question, um, it, it's been a long, long process, I must say. It, it doesn't happen overnight. So it follows a long process of workshops, uh, trips to the fields, you know, taking the, the, the girls into the sites of, uh, you know, of the fields, fields that are no longer working or no, no longer being used, and then fields that are still producing and all that. So it's been a, a long process to reach this uh, uh, time when girls say, they say, um, we are ready, we want to do it. And part of that also in, includes if they've been exposed to food, like, the, like these questions of where does your food come from? What do you eat and why do you eat what you eat? Why don't why are you not eating the traditional food? And 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 have uh, discussions around that. But I think what made it to make sense for them is when climate change became a reality in their areas. That is when they um got educated about climate science and what it means, but also when they uh they started to understand that the traditional the traditional knowledge they have uh, from their parents and grandparents uh, is it's a it's a science knowledge that also speaks to address uh, challenges of climate change so it, it, it's a number of things that they have been learning on the on 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 the, on the way and including uh, that is also understanding about the the role of uh, of different species animals uh, 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 birds and um, and bees you know in the in food production so i think when they started to to study uh, things like uh, what the birds tell us you know the the the, the southern ground hornbill uh, I think we co you call it in Singizi, maybe in your areas, and the birds like um, uh, that tell us about the planting season, like Upez Gomkorn. So when they understood that there's uh, climate science, there's bird science, also there's animal species science, but how does that uh, speak to um, to food? You know, for an example, 
and I think you know all those kind of trainings that help them to understand the connectedness of things, the web of life, in in a practical sense. It has it is what has helped them to to be involved. But I think uh, when it comes to to agroecology itself, I think it's it's the food that they saw and understood, you know, how nutritious that food is. So the health part of health and nutrition helped them to understand that even if they don't like, they didn't like the food at the beginning, but because they understood and analyzed the, the nutrients in those food. So it helped them to understand that the food, the traditional food is good. So it has been a series of things over a period of time and then coming to the point where uh, girls are able to, to, to say, we want our land, you know, and we have asked the parents, you know, because a girl cannot have land, uh, but we have asked the parents to say, can you give a plot and a piece of land to the girls so that they can start reimagining, you know, what they, what, what, what is, and parents by but done by themselves so that process as well helped a lot because now the girl knew that she can, she has got a plot in her in, in in her in her household where she can plant and that grew up in in or it is growing up to her seeing that um i think one thing that the, the girls like you know is money you know if the if what they are doing doesn't produce money they really do not want to participate. So once now that they are beginning to make a little bit of money from their plots, it is what makes them interested in 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 in, in working um, in, uh, on the fields and being able to sell a few things. I think that is the difference between them and their parents. Their parents didn't sell a lot; they exchanged, which is also good. But the girls are coming with a, 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 an, an aspect of selling and they are encouraging their parents on, you know, how to sell the surplus food. So I hope that has answered you. Thank you. Thanks, Mugile. Um, so, John, I see you are back. Um, uh, so there was just a question from Suzeka. The question reads, another question, we have fruit and veggies that we dry to use it for the next period. So how long can we keep it before using it as supermarkets have expiry dates? So I guess a question around um, the the use of like, yeah, when does when do we know when food has expired? Um, I think we have lost John again. Um, uh, this seems. Um, so John responded um, in the chat asked him. Uh, he responded, um, he said to me directly that he keeps dried vegetables for a maximum of eight months. Okay. Okay, so that's the answer then. Um, okay, we have some comments from Tinira Rural Development. I'm not sure who is joining us. Um, the comment was, um, <laughs> agroecology was created for this problem. We learn from others' methods, but when it cannot nourish, then there's no point. Uh, I think I might be missing uh, the previous comment. Um, do uh, whoever is it? Uh, Joining from Tinira, would you like to uh, make an oral contribution? Perhaps you would um, capture it uh, if you if you feel comfortable unmuting. Otherwise, I can just read your your comment. I'm not sure if it's directed at Sibungile. Um, okay. Um, I think let's 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 wrap up um, because we're getting to our the end of our session, and I just want to share um, a few um, 
resources that I think would be useful. So um, as you would have seen in the WhatsApp group, we made a little um, fact sheet with uh, a sort of one-on-one -on -one how to encourage agroecology in our communities. So, um, and then I just wanted to, yeah, I wanted to highlight this um, little video clip uh, from the African Climate Reality Project, which focuses on um, gender and actually features Sibungile from our talk today. So just um, we'll share it. The, the link was shared in the WhatsApp group, but it's um, it's definitely worth worth watching. Um, I thought we might have time to, to do it today, but I think we won't um, uh, we won't have time to go through that in too much detail. This is the fact sheet that we shared with you. Um, we'll also share a um, colorless uh, version if you want to use it to print out um, in your offices. Uh, so it'll be with less color and, and hopefully not use too much ink. Um, so it's just a, yeah, one-on-one. -on -one a 101 uh, agroecology 101 um, fact sheet on encouraging agroecology in our communities and and faith um, faith groups and then um, finally i just want to highlight um, that south africa does have this um a food sovereignty campaign that is linked with the justice charter movement um, or the climate justice charter movement emerged from that. And they have some really interesting um, toolkits and resources um, that are available online that I wanted to share with you. So they have these activist guides um, uh, and you can download them online. Um, so climate, Climate Justice Through Land Justice, a Food Sovereignty Activist's Guide, um, Building People's Power for Water Sovereignty Activist's Guide. Then this is the People's Sovereignty Act, which is, comes out of the um, Food Sovereignty Campaign. They also have an activist guide on advancing food sovereignty through seed saving, um, uh, Food Sovereignty for the Right to Food, a guide for grassroots activism, um, and yeah, uh, focus on workers, cooperatives, um, an activist guide around the solidarity economy, um, what Sibungile was talking about in terms of, you know, growing food to share with each other um, and exchange with each other rather than necessarily um, uh, always selling it and operating through the conventional uh, market economy. And then, um, uh, this other activist guide on uh, food sovereignty, which is focusing on uh, case studies, but also has um, various uh, sort of exercises and and step-by-step uh, -step, uh, sort of understanding of how to build food sovereignty hubs in our different communities. Um, and then finally, they also have a people's planning tool for a deep just transition um, activist guide. So I will be sharing the link um, to these guides and educational documents uh, in the WhatsApp group after this um, webinar is finished. But yeah, I think um, we um, have come to the end of our seminar and um, yeah, if there are any, any closing remarks, uh, Sibungile and John, that you would like to make, um, please uh, feel free. Perhaps we can uh, start, uh, Sibungile, you can start and then um, John, you can uh, chip in if you have any closing remarks. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. I would like to say thank you, Seabonga Kakulu, 
for this day. I think um, what I've learned from today is a, it's a pool of powerful people who are, who, whose hearts are at the right place. And we are all here because we have realized that there's a problem and we are addressing uh, those problems. You know, it's either uh, food security, water, and uh, you know, all those kind of things uh, that are concerning us. But I think what uh, makes us all here unique is that we are taking um, from uh, the knowledge of the past, we want that knowledge to live, we want to preserve that knowledge, we want to show that knowledge as knowledge uh, that uh, can still address the challenges of today and more than everything, I think we want to live um, a healthy life uh, with good food as we are addressing challenges of climate change, uh, challenges of soil degradation in our areas, challenges of poor ecosystems that uh, make us very, very vulnerable, especially in, in times of, uh, of, uh, of disasters like floods or drought. So uh, I'm very humbled by all of you and I wish and pray that every uh, you know, sometime in our lives we meet and in this way or, or in a different way. Thank you. Thank you, Sibungile. Um, John, uh, if you uh, can, could come in for any closing comments, if you have. Um, Oh, I think we might have lost John again. Today seems to have been a bad day for connectivity um, issues. Um, but yeah, so I just want to thank everybody for their time and for taking part in the seminar. Um, and as usual, um, uh, I see John is, is recording an audio that he will share with us. Um, but in the meantime, I just have a request that we all um, switch on our cameras as we are uh, getting ready um, to say goodbye. Ah, yes, Claire, if you want to, if you want to play the, the audio, um, Please, from John, please go for it, and then we can. Um... Yeah, my network is a problem, and uh, yeah, <laughs> I think uh, only what I can say is uh, we farmers communities, they are the, uh, the people who can make a decision of what they want to see in their own environment. So if you want a change in uh, what you call the agroecology, the food sovereign systems, it is us who can do that. So it is them who can produce the food they like. And they, they can select any type of food they want to grow, and they can grow it. Otherwise, thank you very much for organizing this. And uh, unfortunately, I can't uh, go on the Zoom because it's in uh, network. It's not, good. it's not good here because of electricity is gone. Okay, well, at least we could hear uh, the closing comments from, from John.